So it's uh, recording now. The the microphone. Okay, the microphone. Mm -hmm. the microphone. Can you speak? Uh, what? Try, try speaking. Yeah. Try speaking something. Yeah. Hello. Work. Just yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for coming to my presentation about uh, the EGLE framework. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about how to build uh, high performance applications in ISP.NET Core and I hope I will show you that this framework is not evil anymore and it's uh, quite good for, uh, a majority, for building majority of applications nowadays. Uh, first let me introduce myself, my name is Yager Bitsky and um, I'm working for for finance and e-commerce industry for the last 15 years. Uh, currently, I'm a co-founder of a company called Webstalking SRO uh, with a headquarter in, uh, in Prague, Czech Republic. And uh, I'm using .NET since uh, version 2002. And uh, for the last few years, I'm super happy about what Microsoft is doing uh, when they start open source the things and they start contributing to the community. And I, I believe that uh, Modern.net has a great, uh, great future, and I hope I'll show you, uh, and you'll try to, uh, will try to ch check it and uh, do something. Okay, so uh, first let's talk about what Modern.net is, uh, because currently we have uh, uh, several uh, implementations of .net. Uh, the classical one is the .net framework, uh, that is uh, .net you know for the last like 10, 15 years. And uh, it's used for, bu uh, for building classical Windows applications like WPF or Windows Forms, like building like, console tools, and uh, classical ISP.NET, uh, as you know, like web forms, for example. Uh, there is new.NET, that is uh, .NET Core, uh, that is a cross-platform framework that is uh, used mostly for building uh, console applications, uh, ISP.NET Core applications that you can run on any environment, and also, uh, UWP and Xamarin Forms apps that you can uh, run on mobile uh, or on the latest Windows like Windows 10 and hopefully they will be uh, scalable so you can run the same app on a tablet or a mobile phone or a uh, normal desktop computer. And also, there's also Xamarin and uh, uh, Xamarin is a um, new version of Mono so the guys who built Mono they uh, started a company and their goal was to bring .NET into mobile world. So with Xamarin you can build uh, iOS and Android apps and also macOS apps. And they all run natively and smoothly and have uh, like, a, like native platforms UI. Uh, there is a, a common misunderstanding uh, between .NET Core and .NET Standard. Uh, so recently Microsoft in introduced .NET Standard and um, that's actually a specification, uh, and uh, if you are trying to build your own .NET implementation, you have to follow this uh, specification. And uh, the goal is to introduce code reuse and um, uh, the way, like you build, if you build your library for .NET standard uh, and it runs on classical .NET, you can take the same library, bring it to .NET Core, and run natively on Linux, and it just all works smoothly. And the, the current version is version 2, and um, if you take a look to all open source libraries available on Nougat, uh, Microsoft claims that around 70% of libraries right now are compatible uh, with .NET standard. That means you can use almost like two thirds of all global libraries available in the world. And uh, there is also a compatibility mode for .NET standard 2. It means that even if your Nougat package uh, doesn't claim that, okay, I'm supporting the standard, you can still try you can still try to inst uh, install it and use, and the, your uh, .NET Core uh, will check in runtime if the API is supported for you or not, and uh, if like all your API calls are supported, it will just work out of the box. So .NET Core. .NET Core, uh, the current version is uh, version 2. Uh, here. Oh, yes. Sorry, technical issues. Oops. 
So, doesn't core. Uh, current version is version 2 and uh, it's fully cross-platform, works on Windows, Linux and Mac. And it's licensed, uh, licensed by MIT license, so you can just do whatever you want with it. Uh, it supports flexible deployments, like you can run it on Docker and deploy it to Azure or the AWS smoothly. And uh, of course, as it is .NET, you can use any programming language you like. And uh, yeah, it wor uh, it's not about just Visual, Visual Studio nowadays. So you can use any uh, any editor you like, Atom, Visual Studio Code, classical Visual Studio. There's Visual Studio for Mac, or uh, there's Rider IDE from JetBrains. It's like a just not a word. It's like dodgy idea, but runs for C sharp. So uh, you can do whenever you like, however you want. So uh, now let's uh, move on and start talking about like uh, performance issues and uh, see how you can kind of scale your app or how you can fix performance things. So first, let's mean, uh, introduce some little bit of philosophy that I'm following when uh, my client has a problem with performance. Uh, so first of all, when you're building a project, you are not Google, uh, because what I've seen a lot when people starting to build a startup, they think, okay, yeah, I'm going to scale for uh, millions of users. That's great if you can do that, but uh, if you want to scale for millions of users, uh, it will be really tough to build it properly. So just start small, build something, and evolve as you need. Uh, always think about return of investment. Again, you're not Google, and uh, as a startup or a small e-commerce company, you cannot invest like a ton of cash just to be like super huge scalable. So just take, uh, build a minimum valuable product, bring it to the market, and see how it works. Yeah, don't reinvent the wheel. That's another problem in our industry. Uh, to be honest, I've seen, I know, probably 20 or 30 different logging frameworks in my career. Uh, but there are some that are available and open source. And solve your problem first. Again, when you are building a project, uh, I think like this is a one of the root of like performance issues. So when you're building a project, you start thinking, okay, I want to do, I want to have like a super scalable and have like a nice architecture. And uh, tomorrow I can move from like SQL Server to MySQL, for example. Uh, usually, it's never happened. Once you're stuck with the database, it's like really hard to change it in the future. So solve your problem and then you know use the tools that are right for your project. And you know performance problems are great because usually it means that your project is getting popular. And uh, I love performance problems myself. Okay, so um, let's take a look. Uh, imagine you have a nice call from a client and saying, "Hey, my site my site is super slow. We cannot sell anything. What's going on?" Uh, the first thing that you can do, like a, just a quick check, uh, just go to Google uh, PageSpeed to let's say like a, it's SaaS service where you just type your URL and it show you like potential performance issues and do some measurement for you. So check your number, and uh, if it's an enterprise app and you don't have like a public API, there's a tool uh, called iSlow. Uh, it has the same, it does the same checks like uh, Google PageSpeed, uh, and it's also open source nowadays. Uh, you can download it from iSlow.org. Uh, just install it. Uh, it's a plugin for the browser and run for the website, and it'll show you some recommendations and also do some trading. Yeah. Another tool is like okay, once you see a okay, cast, things are good, bad, uh, run from developer tools and see all the requests and how much they take, and uh, probably to give you some ideas when you can tune your app to run it faster. Okay, so uh, the first thing to do is just go and implement whatever Google PageSpeed recommends you, because they, they are all valuable recommendations. And if uh, you have, a, let's say, a, a general e-commerce website, uh, in most of the cases it will help, because really, uh, I've seen a lot of performance issues like a slow website, because uh, so your marketing department loaded some huge, like, 5 max images for your product data, and then you are trying to show it on the site. But, you know, it doesn't work all the times, and uh, sometimes you need to go deeper. So, uh, first thing to take a look at is just uh, check your JavaScript and CSS and use some bundling tools to minify it, and in iSpeed.net Core, and, and right now I'm going to talk about iSpeed.net Core, and uh, usually what's applicable for Core is applicable for classical.net, so you can use it very soon. 
uh, this uh, build bundler nuget package and um, what it does is just built in tool for bundling and you create your config file and describe like what JavaScript or CSS you want to bundle and it works and in your view you can uh, use environment tag helper and say okay if it's uh, I'm on development mode then just render all script tags for me without bundling and if I'm in production mode then uh, uh, bundle everything and do this obscure JavaScript. Uh, of course you can use uh, tools like Grunt, Gulp or Webpack, it will do the same job for you, so it's it's up to you really what you want to choose. Yeah. And a uh, few words about dependency management. Uh, uh, nowadays uh, the most popular dependency manager, uh, management tool for .NET is Nougat. It has integration with almost all uh, editors. And um, there's another tool called Packet, so it is an extension of Nougat, and it can download packages from rather Nougat or directly from GitHub. And so it works like similar to GoLang, when you can just download some source code from GitHub and bundle it. Okay, so uh, the next step, like once you modify your JavaScript, CSS, still slow, they go to your images, and there are like tons of libraries how uh, to work with images directly. For example, one of the most popular is Image Magic, and uh, there's the ImageMagic.net, this is a wrapper around uh, Image Magic uh, native library. Uh, if you're running on Windows, if you're on classical.net uh, world, uh, you can use system drawing and system uh, Windows media uh, namespaces, uh, but don't do that. They're quite poor for server-side rendering and uh, they consume a lot of memory and so it's like it's not recommended, just go with image, image magic with that, really. And there are other libraries, so there is GD, it's a competitor for image magic, and others. So that's all like the packages you can check them. Okay, the next step we are going deeper, and uh, we should in, uh, implement like HTTP compression. So it's like really almost no brainer free tool that can improve your performance. Uh, First of all, there is a built-in support for HTTP compression in uh, .NET Core. You just deploy the uh, Nougat package called Response Compression, and you can use JZip. And it also supports I Compression Provider interface, and you can implement your own uh, compression if you like. Uh, if you are Windows on Windows, you can use IS Dynamic Compression Module. Or if you're running on Linux, uh, you you probably will do like an Nginx proxy for your app, uh, Core app, so you can do compression on Nginx, on Nginx side. ISP.NET Core comes with a, uh, its own uh, web server called, called Kestrel. It's all, uh, also open source and cross platform, and it was built with high performance in mind, and um, the latest. Uh, I, I've seen some uh, performance checkups, so uh, nowadays it's one of the most high performance web server available on the market. Uh, so again, like everything in .NET nowadays, you install it through NuGet, you install uh, server.castle package. And uh, this web server was built on the EPUV library uh, to, to be asynchronous, asynchronous from ground up. And this is the same library that's used, for example, for Node.js. And we all know that like, Node.js is doing great jobs for building APIs and stuff, uh, especially when they have like a, a lot of I/O operations. Uh, the latest version, Kestrel version two, can be used as a standalone web server, or you can uh, call it via reverse proxy. I personally call it like via reverse proxy because I like engines. Uh, well, the earlier versions of this uh, of this web server wasn't recommended to be used as a standalone web server. Uh, Kestrel supports uh, Unix domain sockets, uh, WebSocket, and HTTPS. So if you're running on um, Linux, I would suggest you to go with Unix domain sockets because it's bringing better performance. And uh, there are a few uh, settings that you can tune. For example, you can set how many concurrent connections uh, your web server supports, or for example, you can set up uh, how big your page body size should be. And the interesting thing uh, is the last one, mean request body data, uh, data rate. So uh, Kestrel is checking uh, your connection speed between the web server and your client. And by default, if uh, connection speed is going lower, uh, lower than 240 bytes per second, uh, 
webcastrel switched uh, to a gray spirit, so it's waiting for five, uh, five, five seconds uh, for your client to improve uh, the channel and, and otherwise just uh, reject the request. Okay, so that's it's all like all quick fixes and easy to bring, and uh, but you know, it not always doesn't work. Works for say 60 65% of uh, issues, but yeah, uh, we should go deeper. So, uh, I love this recommendation, really. Developers are expensive, and depending on country, they're rather expensive or very expensive. So, just buy more hardware and uh, vertical scalability help somehow sometimes so just like uh, buy a bigger server more RAM more CPU so and probably it will help your project and also some uh, cash on developers uh, also if you're running in a cloud and uh, that you can easily do with uh, iceberg and core uh, since uh, it has docker support so uh, usually what I'm doing I'm uh, when I'm building applications nowadays I just uh, um, build uh, docker packages so I, I deploy my apps with docker bring an image and just deploy it to Azure with AWS and scale it as needed also if you are uh, using one of those providers Azure AWS or Google App Engine all of them support ISP.NET Core natively now and I think like, uh, for AWS you can build even like lambdas in uh, C sharp and uh, .NET Core so it's like all available and uh, people use it Okay, so uh, vertical scalability doesn't work or might be unaffordable if you already have like a, a lot of hardware. So uh, in this case, let's go and take a look what's going on in our HTTP request and uh, what's going on the page. Uh, on the, page. Um, the tool I, uh, I'm using is called Mini Profiler. So basically, it's a package uh, that you put to your website and uh, it intercepts into your HTTP um, pipeline and handles what's going on. Uh, the tool was developed by Stack Exchange, so those guys know what they're doing. <laughs> and uh, you, you can install like mini profiler. This is the like, core of the system. Uh, it does your basic tracking. Uh, it and then you can install your own plugins. For example, there are different plugins for Entity Framework 6 and Entity Framework Core. If you are interested in uh, what's going on in your ORM, uh, there is a profiler DB connection that I really like a lot. So that basically. Um, plugin for your if you're using like AWS natively for example through Daper framework or like Light or RAM then uh, you can install this and see what's going on uh, uh, inside and uh, there are packages that um, track uh, your uh, AMPC in particular so you can take a look how much time you spend on rendering views or controllers and uh, it's like really simple to install you just go install packages and do some little bit of configuration and done it will look like this. So we are in a website, and uh, you can see. Okay, I see like one is con uh, controller, and it takes a lot of time. And you can see that m most of the time is spent like running some SQL. Then you can uh, run your SQL profiler. I'm not sure, like SQL Server profiler, and you can see like oh, what's going on the page, and see like oh yeah, I'm running like hundreds of SQL uh, queries for what reason. So probably in this case, uh, this is a sign that you're using your ORM in the wrong way. And it brings us to the next slide. Uh, I think if you're building an app, uh, first you might, uh, and you work with the database, you must know SQL. Uh, of course, you have like all bunch of ORMs, like NC framework is great, but then under the hood, it runs SQL, and you should know what your SQL is doing. Um, there are different uh, ORMs available. Oh, sorry, in Russian. <laughs> so uh, actually, uh, this is a timing uh, different ORMs spent for mapping just simple POCO objects uh, for five, like for 500 select uh, statements. And uh, so obviously I don't like raw the ADNet SQL data provider is just the fastest one. And the next one is Daper. So Daper is a micro ORM and uh, it does nothing to do, uh, nothing except uh, match it, running your SQL and mapping to your classes. That's it. And you really have to develop, like you write your SQL, you don't use link. And I, I love this tool, so highly recommend it. Okay, and uh, so know what your ORM is doing. Okay, um, we did a lot of optimization on data layer and like, tuning here and there. Still, that didn't help us. Uh, what we should do? Probably we have to think about caching. And uh, caching is good, especially if you have a lot of memory. 
And uh, caching is widely supported on ISP.NET Core uh, and has different layer levels of caching. First of all, there's the iMemory cache interface and um, uh, it's installed via uh, caching memory um, nugget package. So um, it will allow you to do like memory caching on the server. If you're using Redis, for example, then you can um, uh, have an implementation of a distributed cache interface and uh, we have Redis and SQL Server available out of the box. So in this case, uh, you will have almost the same API as working with memory, but it will store to Redis and your code just works. Uh, on the next level, uh, so this was like a lower level, you're working with code. And that's the next level, you can do caching inside your views. So you're writing your views in, uh, in Razor syntax that looks like HTML. And uh, you just say, okay, I want to cache this chunk of code. And then the rest will be done automatically by ISP.NET Core. So it will just uh, do caching during the rendering time. And again, you have a choice. You can store in the memory or in your distributed cache, like Redis. There is also a response cache attribute. Uh, it's more for like caching fine tuning. For example, you have a controller and you want to you want to tune uh, cache like HTTP caching attributes. Then you just apply this attribute to, uh, and um, uh, configure like for how long you're gonna store the output of this uh, controller. Uh, and uh, if you want to use this attribute, you have to install the, this package Microsoft Azure Core Response uh, Response Caching. Okay, so we did some caching. Our performance uh, looks a bit better, but now we are starting. Uh, we can start seeing that okay, we have memory leak because our memory just spikes and it goes beyond uh, the threshold. So the first question: Do we have a problem with GC? Maybe like uh, Microsoft did some obscure thing in GC, and like there's a bug in, the, in our platform. Let's go like to C++ and ask them there fix it. Uh, thanks God, it's usually not the case. Uh, first of all, let me just uh, play something like um, do a quick introduction to .NET GC. So in .NET GC, uh, memory, uh, basically you have uh, three, uh, three generations, generation 1, 2, one, one, zero, 1, and 2, and um, basically all your objects when they create they go to generation 0, and then um, when you're running out of memory, usually your garbage collector just go and check uh, what's in zero and freeze it. Whoever survives in generation uh, generation zero moves to generation one, and then from one to two. So usually uh, in generation two you have like this long living object, and usually they consume like a bit of memory. And there is also a large object cache. That's a special dedicated part of uh, .NET mem like runtime memory where it stores huge objects. And it has its uh, and it does like special uh, garbage collector algorithms to clean it up. Uh, okay, and it does not have to support uh, different uh, modes of garbage collector. There's a uh, workstation uh, GC and server side GC. Since we're talking about uh, web apps, we're interested in server side GC. And um, also, you can have a choice between like like background for server side, you have a background GC, so it means it runs in like parallel and different threads, and it just like different threads are checking uh, what's going on in your memory and uh, uses foreground threads or background threads, for example, on Windows to uh, clean it up. And in a non current uh, GC, it means like you have you stop your universe, do uh, clean up, memory clean up, and then start again. So uh, by default, uh, when you're running a, win uh, Windows, like a server app, you have a server you see in the background mode. And uh, based on my experience, it just works fine. But if you want to change, uh, and if you're like, on Windows and classical ISP.NET, then you should change by config file and you can choose your mode. Uh, also on Windows and iOS, there is another uh, there is another option called GC streaming commit on low memory. and um, if you're running a hosting environment uh, and you have a lot of uh, small websites uh, running uh, on your one server, then this attribute should be true. It means that this attribute means that when you are uh, when your GC runs and it doesn't um, they freeze uh, all the memory uh, and uh, it just keeps something for your app. Uh, 
so, uh, and uh, if you do like this GC gym commit on all memory, it means like when your memory goes uh, more than eight, memory consumption goes beyond eighty percent, then uh, your GC like tries to really clean whatever whatever possible, and it's just like it just like re it's really heavy on that. Works well for small sites uh, on one server, doesn't work well for uh, like one large app, for example. Uh, okay, if you are on ISP.NET Core side, then uh, there is a runtime config file where you can uh, do the same settings, and here uh, you can basically change the same things. Okay, and uh, if you are uh, using Windows and uh, you are on Visual Studio 2017 Community Edition, then you have uh, all profiling tools available for you for free uh, built into the IDE. And uh, there's a memory profiler, so uh, here you can see I'm running my app. And uh, uh, you can run it in a like, debugger mode. You can uh, take a snapshot of your current memory. And then from this snapshot, you can see, OK, what objects I have and how many uh, bytes were allocated for, the same op for, for this object. And then you can find out, OK, oh, I have, like here, I have a list of strings. And it takes a lot of memory. So let's take to go to the code and see what's going on. And uh, also, uh, you, uh, you can see like the absolute value, but you can also do like make several snapshots, and you can see there a different size. You can see what object, what type is growing faster, and then uh, try to analyze your code and try to find and solve it. And for example, in, in this like small simple sample, it, there's this, this times uh, list, and you're just adding and adding some data over there. Okay. Uh, so. But you know, if you're in production, you cannot run your app in a debugger. Really, uh, of course, you can do like a remote debugging. You can connect to your server and do like snapshots. But it's not always available, uh, applicable, or available. Um, there is a tool, but uh, this is tool for Windows, and uh, it it's like for uh, ten years old. I think it's called Perfview, and what is that? Uh, you can you, uh, you can have a um, uh, it is for Windows events and uh, uh, some like kernel side events and trying to analyze uh, what's going on and you can do it like for like for for your hardware for software for like drivers but also there is a uh, support for .NET and here you can see uh, you can ask this tool okay uh, in what generation of my garbage collector we have more objects or uh, like oh here we're asking like uh, in what generation I spent more time doing garbage collection. For example, if it will be somewhere on like uh, on generation two and they spend a lot of time in garbage collecting this one, it means that something is really wrong going on here. And something was wrong with our tool. Uh, we can also see you know, where does application allocates memory, so you can check okay, I have my large object uh, heap where you have like a huge object, you can see how much uh, objects you have there and like Go deep inside. Uh, we uh, we can also uh, we can also see um, the data types as we uh, saw in a in the profile in Visual Studio. Okay, so uh, another approach what we can uh, take is uh, we can uh, let's say we cannot run a debugger on our live server. Uh, so in this case, we can use two WinGDB or LLDB, depending on if you're running on Windows or Linux, to natively like to have a memory dump and then just go inside this dump and see what's going on and debug this dump and take this information. For this is the example for WinDBG, so we're just doing a memory dump, and this is like how the tool looks. And then you have like a bunch of commands. Okay, load source CLR means we are loading support for .NET. And then we can just go to the dump here, try to find like how much memory, like how many, so where are the allocations for my strings, and, and then review what, what's going on. That's quite a useful tool. It takes time to pick it up, but once you pick it up, you will love it. Okay, I want to spend like a, a minute talking about pagination because this is a problem I've seen a lot in many apps. Uh, nowadays, uh, if you're doing C sharp, you're using Link, and in Link you can, uh, uh, for example, here I'm. Uh, there's this database called because it's a link for ASD framework, and what it's doing, you just take all the persons and dump it into memory, and then you just use take operation to take 
hundred uh, persons, and that's the cause of many memory leaks. And you know, in this case, just really just go and rewrite this plain SQL. That's easy, straightforward, and you will reduce your memory consumption. Uh, there is a tool called uh, uh, in ISP.NET Core 2.1, uh, this is the latest version. Uh, Microsoft introduced uh, uh, a new type called Span T, and uh, the goal of this type is to uh, bring uh, array interface uh, that works across different uh, types of memory. For example, you can use kind of array operations for your memory that like non uh, for native memory, non managed memory that allocated in your stack. And for example, you can use memory T a type uh, that can take this uh, your stack memory and bring it to your sync operation, and like you, you can do like all kinds of stuff with memory. We just recommend to take a look if you do like a memory heavy uh, operations uh, apps. Okay, so uh, well, we can think about manual memory management. Yes, yeah, not that's the managed environment, but you can do that. First of all, there's a weak reference type, and it works in the way that if you, let's say, if you have a lot of objects, but you don't care if it survives or not survives, you can uh, create uh, create those a weak reference. It means a garbage collector may kill this object without you knowing it, and even if somebody is referenced, it, a garbage collector can, can kill it, and uh, it helps somehow. Uh, there is also GC settings latency mode, uh, and you can set up your garbage collector to be like a low level. In like low to level latency, it means you are in this case you are going to do you say that the .NET you allocate a lot of small objects, for example, and uh, please don't run garbage collector for me in this time. And .NET tries not trying garbage collector, and uh, it works well uh, for small objects, but don't do it for large objects because you will just break your app. And uh, once you are leaving GC latency mode, uh, low latency, uh, you must call GC collect to free up. Uh, your, mem your memory. Uh, there is also no no GC mode, so you can uh, have a section in your code and say, okay, I don't want garbage collector to run here, and you just annotate your uh, your chunk of memory, like your code, and this code will be executed without garbage collection. And uh, in core CLR, this is actually not the core uh, runtime. Uh, now there is a possibility to bring your own garbage collector. And there's a example on GitHub uh, down here how you can build like a no GC GC. Um, I think it brings a lot of opportunity for the future. Okay, so we did some uh, GC tuning, but uh, our application seems to be slow. So the next question, like, uh, is like what's going on? And uh, I would like personally, I would probably take a look to I/O operations and not network operations to see what's going on over there. Uh, again, mini mini profiler can help us with that. So here you can see that uh, our controller uh, calls check status uh, method, and it takes a lot of time. Then you can go to this uh, method and uh, use uh, profiler API to annotate, okay, I want to take a look how much time is spending uh, on calling this particular request. And after that, in your log, you will see, okay, in my check status method, we are, we are spending 5,000 plus milliseconds just to call an API. So yeah, something is going on wrong here. Uh, then we go, again, if it's like in, develop, in development mode, in staging environment, then you can run your Visual Studio profiler and uh, and uh, run your code profiler. And in this case, you will see, okay, what operation is called and how much is take. So you see, uh, there's an API call. I haven't loaded the VTP uh, file here, so it's just some obscure number in memory. Uh, but here you can go down and see where exactly it's called, and uh, even go right to your source code and see, OK, we are spending most of the time calling this particular API. And uh, as you can see here, um, the, there's a async away, there are async await keywords in C sharp, and they allow you to bring some asynchronous operations. For example, if you're calling somebody uh, over the network, you don't want your web server to wait till your request is done. Um, it's like a Node.js, for example, and you are calling it, uh, calling this code asynchronously. Uh, but the truth is, uh, you are thinking, okay, I'm calling it asynchronously. Probably I will have a like, better performance. Uh, it doesn't 
uh, the case, as you can see in this example, because it doesn't matter if you're calling a code asynchronously or synchronously, it will take the same amount of time to execute. It's just a matter of how your uh, threads are managed by your web server. Uh, so, uh, so .NET has a taskbar library. They have it for a long time. Uh, it's available on the core now. Uh, it allows you to, 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 uh, to do some asynchronous operations. You can do like from Run stuff in parallel, or you, you can do like a really thing like, a, okay, I want to run my code, parallelize it by and chunk it, and then like do like parallel map reduce, all type of things. Uh, but you know, don't go crazy with that. And uh, that's my next slide is I think a way it's faster. But it's not guaranteed. So uh, asynchronous operation doesn't mean that you will have like super fast app. Uh, first of all, uh, if your your code is uh, doing a lot of I/O or network operations, that is great candidate to choose asynchronous stuff because you usually spend time on like the network latency or like uh, reading from a hard drive. But if you're running calculation, like uh, I worked for finance industry for years, and like what I read hard is like when you're trying to calculate something, just do it single threaded really uh, because in this case uh, you're not going to spend uh, your CPU is not going to spend time like on context switching uh, because uh, let's say if you have like for calculating some formulas and uh, sometimes you can be in a situation that uh, your actual code takes less time than the context switching in your CPU if you don't do it right so also I think a way that's helpful if you're running like a long running operation and you want to have a possibility for the user to cancel it. Uh, works pretty well and easy to implement. And um, yeah, context switching helps you run faster, but not always, as I said. And you know, uh, don't please don't make your all operations uh, all uh, methods asynchronous. Uh, it just doesn't work this way. Okay, so. This is async await and TPL, and uh, if you're going to scale up even more, then you should talk more about like message queues and microservices. And that's like, if you are at this point of time, so hopefully your app is like, really popular and uh, it brings you money, so you have budget to do it. And uh, like, .NET was on the market for years, and uh, there are APIs for almost any MQ. Uh, so any any MQ like server you can find this market like you can use Redis like there's some static exchange zero MQ Kafka uh, Solas whatever and um, there are also on top of those MQ libraries there are service bus implementations uh, the most popular is uh, N service bus so basically they bring you a framework and uh, you can you can build your services on top of those framework. And it has an API that will allow you allow your services to communicate to each other. And for the mass transit is kind of quite popular nowadays. Okay, so uh, I think that's all about my quick introduction. And let's summarize the stuff. Like first of all, when you're doing something, when you're building something, think about return of investment and uh, how much money you make out of it, or how much fun you make out of it. It depends on the project. Uh, if you want to, if you have a performance issue on a web app, uh, run Google PageSpeed and those tools, and they will have a lot. Uh, vertical, scal vertical scalability is not bad; it's usually good, and it's uh, it might be like a quick win. And uh, check databases, uh, no SQL, and know how database works. Uh, if database doesn't help, then think about like memory profiling and GC tuning. But it's like a, yeah. It's kind of like magic sometimes, and like I personally try to avoid this uh, if possible. Uh, so caching and uh, think about MQ solutions if the project is getting like, really complicated. Thank you. And um, yeah, we still have two minutes for questions. <laughs> hmm? uh, so you mentioned that we can use uh, as .NET Core for creating uh, cross-platform apps. Yes. Uh, like yeah, uh, so uh, like uh, the last talk was on Kotlin native, right? Uh, and I know there are many more platforms that we can use to create cross-platform apps. Mm -hmm. So uh, is there any catch in using ASP.NET Core, or is there any benefit that will like uh, help me out like, uh, in uh, using ASP.NET uh, as okay. platforms? Yeah, okay, so uh, first of all, uh, 
um, I love C sharp language. Language is awesome. Okay. It just brings you a functional program programming paradigm and uh, object oriented programming paradigm, and uh, you can mix them together. And they have they have like a really nice things like a link, for example. So you are declaratively dealing with your collections. Uh, in terms of performance, uh, I think Microsoft has like uh, they they were trying to hire a lot of guys who are working on Node.js and uh, some Nginx. So uh, they have a really qualified people for for building uh, ISP uh, for building like high performance, high scalable apps. And uh, otherwise. It's just easy to use, like and especially if you are like, on Visual Studio. I'm not selling it now, but like if you have Visual Studio, it's just like it runs smoothly. And I was playing with uh, Rider recently, and it looks like it's even better. So it, you know, I like in my opinion it was built. You know, it was built with a kind of uh, to make your app faster. So it, yeah. It's just like it's more like a time to market, so build it fast type of things. Do we have any more questions for Ilya? Yeah. Awesome. So uh, if you have any, any question about uh, .NET Core and how to run Linux, uh, just send me a message. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you.